We have begun to study uh, John's first letter. If you'd like to turn over to 1 John, that's where we're going to uh, continue this morning. I love our Bible study downstairs. It's, it's just um, such a, a, a God deal. Um, in so many ways, He has shown up in, in mighty ways to move and save and to deliver people off the streets. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to simply walk verse by verse through the New Testament. And that was such a um, formable time for myself. And I'll never forget when we got to 1 John. 1 John is a very special book. It's a heavy-hitting book. It's a powerful book um, where John reveals plain truth. And there was an individual uh, who approached me after one of our lessons, and we had had several uh, back and forth uh, disagreements about the scriptures. And I was thinking, I really don't want to have this uh, this conversation after uh, Bible class. But he insisted, I, I need to talk to you, and he quoted uh, for me First John three six, I believe was. Uh, one of the things he had a, a contention with, I want to read that for you. It says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sin sinning has either seen him or known him. And he said to me, You mean to tell me that this is true? I have never heard this before in my entire life. And I simply responded by saying, you just read it from the Word of God. This is true. This is the evidence of the new birth. When God does a work that He gives power over sin to live a holy and a sanctified life. And there are many things in this book uh, that from an American perspective we just haven't heard before. They're not stressed. This is a pure apostolic gospel. This is the message that was received from the beginning straight from Jesus that was given to the Apostle John. And he proclaims these things to us. This individual uh, was delivered from homelessness. It was that scripture that God used to turn his life around, and he's now uh, doing well in, in oil cells. But I'll never forget um, the, the power of this little book. And I hope that you have a, a hunger, and, and I, God has given me a hunger as I approach this book. I want my life to be changed. I want to encounter God. I want to uh, come to know Him in a full way. I want to uh, be a messenger of the pure gospel. I want to see these things which John is, is preaching uh, to thrive um, as they have all throughout the world. I want them to thrive in this community. And so I hope you're excited about these uh, things this morning. We're going to begin in 1 John uh, 1, verse 5. So if you'd like to follow along with me, that's where I'm going to uh, start this morning. John carried by the Holy Spirit, says these words, This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. I want you to notice here the simplicity of what John is saying. I want you to notice here the logical contradiction that John brings before us this morning, that it, it is impossible for both light and and darkness to dwell in the same place. This is the simple message, but it is the heavy-hitting, uh, powerful uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to illustrate it for us this morning. If you look over at two 
uh, 15, the second chapter, verse 15, we may start to understand John's sense and what does he mean that light and darkness cannot dwell together. And the fact that it's impossible for one to both glory in Christ, to treasure Him above all things, and at the same time, to glory in the world. It's not possible for these two things to exist together. Look at what John says in the second chapter, verse 15. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you notice here that it's, it's not possible to have two loves? You can't love the world and at the same time love the Father. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so we have two desires, the desire of darkness and the desire of light. And these in Scripture are uh, pitted against each other. Let us question among ourselves. What is the delight of our heart? Who is our God? What thing do we worship? Do we love the things that are passing away? Do we love the darkness? Or is God our one desire? According to John, this is a sure sign that we have saving faith if, if God is our ultimate uh, treasure and love. It is an elementary, basic, defining feature of apostolic Christianity to have this singular affection for God which surpasses all others. And can we say with the him writer, that the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look to at what Paul says as he describes uh, the difference between what it is to walk in the light and what it is to walk in darkness. This is helpful to us to understand what is being said here. Galatians 5.17, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so the apostle speaks of these competing desires that are opposed to one another, and he points out once again the impossibility of being led by the Spirit and following after the Spirit and walking in the footsteps of Jesus, which is the definition of a Christian, and then at the same time following, being led by the desires of the world. Church, I want you to consider this morning but that it's not possible for me to drive north and south at the same time. I cannot, as I am driving south, declare that I am headed north. And that works the same if I'm going east and west, if I'm lukewarm, but the, the Bible uh, commands, it is clear that we are to be headed in one direction. We are to be led towards the light of Jesus Christ. We are to be following in uh, the footsteps of Christ. And I want you to consider um, a, a twofold um, a, a danger that is, that is um, relevant uh, to each one of us. Consider that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. It is very easy for us to be self-deceived. Also, consider 
that Satan is the master deceiver. And when you combine both of these, it is the perfect storm. And John is speaking to the likes of us. Speaking to people that are easily confused and can turn religion upside down and can and can declare to others that as they are traveling south, that they are in fact traveling north. Woe unto us, let us be discerning, let us have a sense of awe and fear at the, the frail nature, at the foolishness of sheep, and our inability to guide ourselves, and let us come humbly and discern what is being said before us in the Word of God as, as John's concern. And it is evident within the churches of Asia Minor and, and Ephesus and the surrounding churches that this very principle is at work. There are people who believe themselves to be saved, but they are not because they are in clear contradiction of the plain teaching of the gospel. I'm here to tell you today that this is just as much a problem today in our American culture, if not ten times more of a problem today than it was back then. And so we individually are not to go around and simply judge people for judging sake, but we are to take these words for the love of God, for this earnest desire to live eternally, for the desire to save as many people as possible, to apply the living words of God, this gospel that was received at first that is now offered to us, we are to apply this to our own souls in order that we might have assurance of everlasting life and we might offer this eternal gift to those around us. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. We cannot walk in the darkness and pretend that there is a harvest of righteousness that awaits us in heaven. God is not mocked. John is saying that if we come in contact with the all-powerful Creator God of Scripture, that our lives should be transformed. They should be changed. We should now swim upstream. Instead of producing bad fruit uh, by nature, we have been created into a good tree that now produces good fruit. And that is the evidence that we have of uh, saving faith and eternal life. Uh, 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that He appeared in order to take away sins. If we stop right there, if we apply our common theology, we would say, look, here, God's taken away all of my sins. We're good, but let's read on. Let's see in what sense and what does the context say? What does he mean by the fact that Jesus has come to take away the sins of the world? As we read on, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him, that is, no one who is in the light, who has fellowship with God, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sin sinning has either seen him or known him. This is the message that John proclaims that he received straight from Jesus that has uh, descended from above. I want us just to back up this morning and to consider uh, the brokenness of man. The Bible depicts as it describes the, um, the earth that it lies in complete darkness. And this is a reference to the sinfulness, to the depravity, to the brokenness of man. And it depicts Jesus as the ultimate one true light. And as we read here, as John says in his gospel, um, pay special attention to what is taking place here. John 1.9, he says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. 
He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And do you see this strange mystery here? Do you see uh, the, the irony that though Jesus created the world, though he created mankind, we did not receive him, but we rejected him. And this is uh, something that we are to rightly tremble at and to be concerned with that according to nature, what is natural, men reject God. They suppress this light of the world. And he goes on to further state um, after that great uh, passage in, in John 3.16 where the Father offers the greatest gift to the world. And strangely, right after this, we read in verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. This is truly a great mystery and something uh, to discern uh, the nature of man. The social sciences make a great effort to try to pinpoint, to diagram the heart of man, to understand who we are. But apart from Scripture, it is impossible to, for us to understand who we are and to understand also uh, this uh, darkened uh, depravity which we are reading about. I want us also to read about uh, what Paul says in Romans 1.21. It's, it's a parallel passage uh, and helps us to understand this relationship between the light and darkness and our response to our Father in the Gospel. Romans 1.21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the Creator rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And here we have a profound and probably the, the place where it is best stated to describe here the rejection of God in the ancient world, the desire to choose darkness over the light that they had in the first covenant. And what I want us to realize this morning is, once again, there should be a sense of, of awe and a sense of even trembling as we consider the nature of man, which it is natural to him to want nothing to do with the light of God and to prefer darkness over light, and we need to test our own souls ever so closely to see that we do not fall into this category. Over the past few weeks, I've had uh, four different uh, counseling opportunities uh, with uh, four people from the streets, and I have had the opportunity to express to them in the most plain terms and with a full heart to lay bare before them the light of the gospel. And what was so uh, concerning to me in these four instances is like in Romans, uh, it, it expressly says that the people of the ancient world, they knew God. And for instance, in this country, we 
know God. We have the Word of God. We have the Gospel. And as I laid this before these four people and expressed to them the same message, that all around us is darkness. And to live on the streets is to live in the darkness of Satan. And as I offered to them Christ, and I put the light before them, and I said, even today you can receive Him. I have a place for you to go to a faith-based recovery program. In each instance, all four of these people said, I'm not interested in this. And I want us to instead of condemning these individuals and instead of judging them, I want us to just step back and to consider the darkness of the soul of man and this tendency to prefer sin and depravity, to exchange the glory of God, to exchange the endless worth of Jesus Christ and all of His perfections and love for uh, for dung, for for foolish things, for temporal gain and 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 love, and I want us to uh, test ourselves this morning to to make sure that we are not in a similar situation. I want us to ask this question: In what ways do we suppress the light? It's easy in those instances to judge those who are on the street to judge people who are open sinners. But let us ask this morning, rather, in what ways do we prefer darkness over the light? Consider in your thought life. Is light reigning or is darkness gaining a foothold? Consider your time. It's it's about the easiest um, example that we can give and and, uh, test that we can give to ourselves is, is, does light rain? Does the the gospel of truth, does this message that John preaches, um, does it express itself in the way that we spend our time, or is darkness uh, creeping into the way that we spend our time? Also consider uh, our resources. Can uh, others see by the way that we use those things that God has given us? Is darkness reigning or is light reigning? Sometimes we struggle to understand how privileged we are. I think the ancient world in Romans, they didn't understand how privileged they were to have a knowledge of God. But Jesus says something uh, incredibly profound as he speaks of uh, the region of, uh, of Chorazin and Bethsaida. He says in Matthew 4, 15, these words, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And church, what I want you to realize is that these people who received the light of the world, they were not able to to discern the greatness of Jesus. And in fact, in their hearts, they preferred darkness over light. And of course, Jesus' message, um, continuing here, was repent. That is, change your hearts, change your minds, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want us to consider that in our uh, rebellion, We have autonomy and we have freedom for in the few fleeting moments that God has given us solely by His grace, we can resist the light of the world. We can oppose Him. We can rebel against Him. We can suppress the light. We can use the very breath that He has given us. We can use the very strength that He has given us to make war against Him and live in darkness and live for uh, the devil But I want you to also consider there is a day coming, the judgment seat of Christ, where all creation is going to be thrust into the presence of the light of the world. On that day, we will be forced to approach the God who lives in unapproachable light. 
That is something to ponder. That day is at hand. The kingdom of of God is at hand. And I want you to consider uh, something of the nature of our uh, author this morning. John is such an incredible uh, man in so many different ways. It is invigorating and inspiring and uplifting to consider this great man. He was the author of of Revelation as well. Consider the things that this man saw, and he writes these words. This is the great vision that the Lord Jesus gave to John. He says in Revelation 20, 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, uh, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And so this is that very scene that we were describing before, that all creation as earth and heaven are fleeing this radiant light of light, all creation, one day soon it is coming, we are all going to be forced into His uh, indescribable, unsearchable light, and we will give an account based on how we esteemed Jesus Christ and what our estimation was of Him and whether or not we appreciated and recognized and discerned the light of the world, or we suppressed this light and wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And so I want us to consider our indescribable privilege. I I think about uh, great men in history and, and martyrs and people which God has raised up to take on darkness, such as William Tyndale, who gave the the world the Bible, who gave the English-speaking world uh, a Bible in their common language. And we are blessed beyond comprehension. On that day, I believe our author, John, he saw each one of us there before the great white throne. And we will have to stand uh, before those um, in Nineveh who repeat, who Uh, repented at the preaching of of Jonah, who received this much light. And as we consider the sin of this great nation, as as we consider what will be read um, on our account, Romans 1 does not apply to us, it applies to the ancient world. What will be read of us is not that we uh, suppressed Um, our knowledge of of God through natural revelation, but what will be read of us is that we suppressed Jesus Christ and the Holy Word of God. And this is a far greater thing, and this is the sense of what Jesus um, is getting at when he speaks to uh, the land of uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, to Chorazin and Bethsaida. And I want us uh, to uh, pause for a moment, and to consider the immeasurable privilege that we have to possess the light of lights, to possess the Word of God, and and the Lord is moving in our midst. And I believe that He is calling us through the inspired Word of God, through the Gospel of John um, and this, uh, this great epistle, to consider what is our opinion as it comes to the light of Jesus Christ. Are we suppressing this or are we letting the light of Jesus have its complete way in our lives? Letting it completely dictate all that we do? Are we cherishing and valuing Him above all things? And I want you also to consider uh, the Apostle John. What, what great things that he saw, that he received from the beginning this 
um, this divine message, that he had this intimacy with Christ, that he saw countless miracles and, and heard the divine wisdom and, and saw Jesus raise the dead and saw him transfigured. And then here he is as an old man who lives in the, in the Holy Spirit of God. And, and he sees uh, heaven itself, and he sees all of these surpassingly great things that are beyond language. This man is, is a heavenly man. He's already passed into eternal life, and he speaks these divine truths to us. Do you think this man cares what anybody else thinks of his religion? He does not apologize for this firm message. He speaks the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is once and for all delivered to the saints. He's not going to apologize to a Laodicean age that wants to uh, drive north and south, that wants to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. But he speaks uh, the words of the king. He is a mouthpiece of God Almighty. And when he speaks, it is final. And this is the word that each one of us is going to have to um, be held accountable for and whether or not we're walking according to the light and whether or not our deeds are found complete in the sight of our God. And so this morning, um, I'm not here to, to judge uh, people uh, any further than what the Word of God says, but I want us to uh, maybe find a, a quiet place later on this evening to take this great book and to draw near to God, to consider the uncertainty of this country, to consider the, the darkness that has creeped in, the forces of Sodom and Gomorrah that are at play in this great nation, and to have a, a holy desire to receive Jesus Christ and Him alone and to abide in the light and to walk according to the light and to fully embrace Him in all ways in order that our joy might be complete, in order that we might know that we have eternal life. Would you do this this afternoon? Would you take these words home and consider these things? I believe this is the Lord's message uh, to the Main Street Church of Christ. If you do not know the Lord Jesus, if you have not received Him in baptism, uh, we have a wonderful and great promise uh, that uh, Jesus has come and He has uh, shown us the, the Word of, of God. Um, he has proclaimed the gospel. He died, He was buried, He rose again on the third day for our justification, and He commands us, He proclaims that we are to repent. We are to turn away from loving and embracing the darkness and rejecting the light of the world, rejecting Christ and suppressing Him to embrace the light. We are to be baptized for the remission of our sins and to be raised to newness of life in order that this light might come and dwell within our souls. And we are to live a pure and consistent life all the days of our life by the infinite grace and power of Almighty God that now lives and that desire, the Holy Spirit that, that leads us, that, that gives us power and grace to live a life of, of freedom. If this is your desire, I would encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing. If there are any other prayers, I would encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing our song of invitation.